I'll be honest, um, the, la the last uh, couple, three months have been a little rough. You know, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised every Sunday people come back um, because, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been kind of rough, really somber teaching. The second Peter, going back to Second Peter, back then we were, we were looking at, at, at this, this God's judgment, right? His judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, and him saying, well, if you judge them, it makes them think it won't judge you. I mean, who do you think you are, right? And then we looked at, at the God's judgment on the people of the day of Noah, and God's judgment on a future date when he's going to return one of these days, and it's like us, and, and that's, that's, that was some heavy stuff. In Second Peter, and we jump into Romans, and, and Paul starts out pretty pretty well, pretty strong, and he's not ashamed of the gospel, and it's, it's exciting and encouraging, like, yeah, the gospel, that's wonderful. Uh, but, but, but then he, he, he takes a really hard turn and talks about, well, this is why you needed the gospel, because you're all a bunch of sinners. <laughs> I mean, I mean um, he, he, we're being saved from God's wrath that's coming against the people that Paul calls fools in chapters two, the rest of chapter one and chapter two, and into chapter three, he's calling people fools who worship the creation rather than the creator, who are living a sexually immoral lifestyles, who, who practice homosexuality, who, who worship idols, who are evil and, and greedy and, and wicked, people who are arrogant God-haters with corrupt minds. Those are the quotes that he talks about specifically. Romans chapter 1 is pretty brutal if uh, you're involved in any of the things that he says there. And, and it makes a person really glad if they don't fall in any of those categories. You're like, man, I'm glad I got past chapter 1. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And then he hits chapter 2, and, and he says, yeah, you guys who are celebrating the fact you're not in chapter 1, you're in 2. You're, you're just as bad. You're just as evil. Uh, you, you know, you're, 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 you're praising God that you're not like those people, but you're guilty. You're guilty. In chapter 2, verse 1. He says, therefore, every one of you, he's talking to the church, every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. So, so all of a sudden, he's, hit, he's targeting us, everybody who's not doing the wicked stuff that he mentions in chapter 1. And he tears into the ugliness of our sin. And, and, and coming to somewhat of a climax in chapter 3, in verse 19, when he says, now we know... That whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut, and the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law." Basically, Paul's saying, hey, we're all lost. Every single one of us, every single one of us are going to face the coming wrath of God. Yeah, it's been a fun couple few weeks <laughs> talking about sin and, and the judgment of God. But that brings him back to the gospel. And in chapter 3, verse 21, he has two really important words. He says, but now. All this is awful. All that you're, there's sin, there's judgment, there's wrath, there's awful things coming. Every one of you, not one of you are sinless, not a one of you are guilt free in this. So you're, it's coming against everybody. But now, he says, but now we've got a chance at beating this coming wrath. The wrath is coming, but now. You have a way out, but now we have hope, but now there is a, a way to reverse this curse and find salvation. But now, verse 21, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. Here's how you get out. Attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ, to all who believe, since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because he because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, now, now Paul's a little different than, than Peter. Peter kind of, if you remember when we're going through Peter, he kind of throws a jab at, 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 
at Paul. Hey, he gets a little wordy sometimes. Let me, let me put it in simple terms, right? <laughs> and, and, and he's right. Uh, if, if you're anything like me, sometimes I'll read some of Paul's writings, which is a lot of the New Testament, and you'll be reading along like in a paragraph like this, and, and pretty soon your mind starts drifting, and you're thinking of like potato salad and, you know, Care Bears, and, and then you're like, oh, wait, what? And you go back and you got to read the sentence again, and like, what did, what did he really say here? Here's, here's, what, here's what he's saying here. Here's what Paul's saying in these verses. But now, apart from the Old Testament law that no one can live up to, okay? We established that. Nobody can live. The whole point of the law was to show us we can't be good enough, right? Apart from that. But now, in a plan that the Old Testament prophets talked about for centuries, we've been looking forward to this moment for centuries of world history. But now, no matter how sinful we have been in the past, God has made a way for us to become right before him. Yes, you are sinners, you have done evil. God has made a way for you to, to be right and pure and holy before him. And it's not through like trying really hard. It's not through paying enough money to impress God. Look, look what I did. God, I, I, helped, I helped feed the, the children. You know, I, I did all these things. That isn't what brings you right with God. It's not through being a really good person and staying out of trouble. We, you know, we all think, well, I've been good. You know, come on, what do you mean I'm a sinner? Well, you are a sinner. We're made right before God, Paul says, to the payment of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, he's getting into some pretty deep theological terms in, in, in that paragraph we, we read earlier, and I think it's important to kind of pause and define these. So I've kind of pulled out seven of the words that these are just, you're not supposed to use these words in church these days. It confuses people, and they get all baffled, and they're like, no, that's because we don't teach them. So let's get these words down. These are words to be familiar to you. Maybe you're like, well, Dell, you could probably fill them in and, and tell me what they are. But just to be careful, I took these out of uh, an actual like Bible dictionary, encyclopedia, uh, I have a couple sources and, and, and came up with definitions rather than just me just saying, hey, here's what I heard. Um, here, here's what they are. The first one's righteousness. And, and righteousness, you hear that word a lot in scripture, it's the state of being just or morally pure, whether in one's own strength or on the basis of imputed virtue. Right? Every word's pretty important in that definition. When we sinned, and we all have, it's been established, we became impure, unholy, unrighteous. Right? There's nothing we could do to make that right and become pure again. Knowing we couldn't do it, God imputes or credits moral purity on us through Jesus Christ. So I've sinned, I'm impure, and God says, I've come up with a way to declare you pure, even though you're not. That, that's, that's what it's talking about when you see the word righteousness. There's nothing you can do, you can't, nothing you can make happen. It's something God declares you. Number two, faith. Now, we all know faith is, well, it's belief, but it's more, more than a casual, like, yeah, I believe in God. Every, you know, you've talked to half the people that say, yeah, I believe in a God. They don't really know what that means. It's, it's more than that. It's belief in and commitment to something or someone. So that's a generic statement. But in the context of, of faith, Biblical faith includes the idea of complete trust in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross as a basis of our righteousness, salvation, and relationship in God. It's, it, 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 it's, uh, uh, you know, if you go into the book of James, which the women are, are studying, you know, faith that works is dead, right? Faith moves you to action. It, it, you don't just sit around and say, yeah, I believe, and, and nothing happens. It changes you because of what you believe in. I believe in God, so therefore I'm going to follow God. I'm going to do what he says. There's a lot in the word faith. Number three, justification. The declaration I like this, that the human um, has been restored to a state of righteousness in God's sight. So it's the process of going from sinner to saint in the eyes of God. He can look at us and say, yep, they sinned. Ah, took care of it. Now they're right. Now they're a saint. It's an easy way to remember that. Maybe you've heard this before. Justification is just as if I've never sinned, right? Uh, it's, it's complete erasing of your past. Justification. Number, number four is grace. God dealing with humans in undeserved ways. The way I was taught it in college is easy to remember. It's just getting what you don't deserve. That's grace. I don't, I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve anything from God. He's not going to give it to you anyway. 
When we go to, to God in faith through Jesus, he pours all of those things on us. Number five is mercy. It's kind of the, the companion to, to grace. It means compassion, pardon, forgiveness. I learned it as a not getting what you do deserve. I deserve the wrath of God. That's, that's what he's been talking about. Peter talked about it. Paul talked about it here in the first three chapters of Romans. The wrath is coming. You earned it. Okay, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Don't get mad at God. You did this. He didn't, right? Don't, don't get mad at anybody. You, you, you did this. I deserve that. I deserve to be the guy on the outside of the ark, not the inside of the ark. I deserve to be the guy in the city of Sodom when the burning sulfur is coming down, not the guy who's all, uh, the, who the angels pulled out. You know, I deserve, I've done everything. I, des- I deserve it all. I deserve it all. It's the complete opposite of affirming or ignoring our sin. It is God acknowledging our sin. Yes, you have sinned. It's us acknowledging our sin. Yes, I have sinned. And then God declares us guilty and unrighteous and worthy of his wrath. But then, through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, his wrath is appeased, and we get to go to heaven anyway. You deserve heaven. You're not going to get it. Because I love you. I love you. And you can connect that with faith and, and the things we were talking about here. Now, number six is redemption. It means a, a release from bondage by means of a price paid. Right? You, you, you redeem a coupon, you re, you know, you're paying for something. The cost of our sin, of our impurity, is death. That's just the way it is. It's, it's death and, and God's wrath against us. But Jesus went to the cross and he died instead. He paid the price. He redeemed us. Right? He, he took the wrath on the cross, paying the price for our sin. And then number seven, mercy seat. This goes back to Old Testament. This is like part of the temple, part of the tabernacle. Um, in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, and on the top of that was this mercy seat. So the priest would come in once a year and sprinkle the blood of the goats on there, and that would be a, a forgiveness of the people of Israel for, for the year. So it's this physical place. Um, Paul is saying here that Jesus is the mercy seat, that he is the place of forgiveness. That's where we go now. We don't need the temple. The veil is torn. We, go, we have complete access to God. Now Jesus is there at any moment, at any time, when you're ready, when you're ready to surrender, give yourself to Jesus. He's right there saying, I'm ready to forgive everything. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. I'm the mercy seat here. Some, some translations might have the word propitiation. You don't hear that too often. Um, you know, you just don't, I've never heard anyone say it in a sentence in a normal uh, situation, but, but it's a word propitiation, which means the turning away of, of wrath. His wrath is, is building and growing, and I've earned it, and everything I do uh, you know, keeps earning more wrath, and then Jesus come and came and paid the price, and now that wrath has been turned away. Jesus took it all. It's, it's, it, it's gone. That, that's what it's talking about here with uh, the mercy seat, that um, God has so richly blessed us with. So, so, so if you put all those words, all these words in this, this little bucket and, and this paragraph that, that, that Paul just gave us in Romans, um, here's what the Apostle Paul is, is saying. You have sinned, and because of your sin, the wrath of God is coming for you. There is no way on earth you can escape or survive his wrath. You can't do it. Nobody can do this for you. Being born in the right country won't do this for you. Going to church a thousand times is not going to do this for you. You can't be good enough. You can't be a smooth talker and come up with great excuses as to why you, you know, maybe you're different than everybody else and the wrath shouldn't come against you. So you can't talk your way out of it. You can't run fast enough to escape the wrath of God. You can't hide good enough. God will find you. You are in serious, eternal damnation trouble. But now, we have Jesus, who died on the cross, taking the full wrath of God that was intended for you. And when we put our undivided faith and trust in him for our salvation, through the blood of Jesus Christ, God declares us right and moral and pure before him. Our sins are forgiven. The price of our sins are paid in full. Therefore, we will not receive the punishment we deserve. Instead, we will receive the very thing we do not deserve, being called sons and daughters of God. Romans is pretty good stuff. So it, just in case your mind drifted and we're thinking about you know, Care Bears and potato salad, that's what he was saying. In, in, in those verses uh, we read. He goes on in verse 27. 
Where then is boasting? You know, you know I'm a Christian, right? <laughs> right? I've, got, I've got this Jesus thing now, right? Have you ever, cause sometimes Christians can have an arrogance to them. So Paul's gonna address us. Hey, 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 guys, bring it back a notch. You didn't do this. <laughs> Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By one of works? No, on the contrary, by a law of faith. For we conclude that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then nullify the law through faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. <laughs> it's not like the Old Testament's irrelevant. <laughs> we read that, we study it, we know it, we learn it, but, but we uphold everything God has done in the past, and, and it all comes to a climax in Jesus on the cross. Paul knows here, uh, if we're not careful, we being the Christians, the church, right, that, that, that we'll, we'll act just like little children. Uh, and we all do. We have that little child in, in, inside us, I think. I grew up in a, in a family with three, three boys, and, and, and we had a never-ending, always present, very intense rivalry at who was the best. I think that's pretty normal in, in families, isn't it? I mean, uh, especially boys, I think. I think in girls, too. Um, uh, yeah. Um, it was just everything. Everything was a contest. Nothing was not a, a, contest, a contest. I mean, uh, it, it was always an opportunity to gloat, to boast, to show how we're better than our brothers, uh, who can finish eating first, uh, who, who can run the fastest, uh, who can make the other brother bleed first, you know, who can uh, have the best grades on the report cards. It was like, okay, everybody open up that envelope, you know, let's, let's, let's take a look at it. And if you knew you had good grades, mom, dad, come on over there, let's look at the grades today, you know, because I knew my older brother didn't have as good of grades. And, and then I could walk around, you know, and say, oh, yeah, I'm pretty smart, aren't I? You know, it was, it, it was just this boasting thing. It, it's, it's in us, right? We're, we're that way. So when one of us got in trouble, it was the perfect opportunity to rub the other brother's nose in it and to strut around the house as if we've never been in trouble in our lives. <laughs> I obey my parents every moment, you know. You obviously don't. I can tell by the way they're yelling at you right now. Ha, 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 ha. And of course, you don't want mom and dad to see that. You just make sure the brother could see you gloating at them while they were being punished, right? But my brother, Jeff, my oldest brother, did struggle with, with, with homework and, and with, with getting good grades. And, and my dad, I remember, I, have, I don't have very memory, many memories of us all together. Like, dad left dead after sixth grade, so this is all lower than the sixth grade. Um, I remember him yelling at my oldest brother, Jeff, telling him to do better, learn those spelling words, you know, do your homework, yeah, all this, all this stuff, right? And I would walk by with this look like, I got my homework done, you know. I mean, it's just boasting thing. It's just, it's just, it's just part of who, who we are. Uh, my, my middle brother, Larry, maybe, maybe he didn't uh, take his laundry to the laundry room quick enough, and, and, and man, he just had to think about smelly socks. I don't know, but, but uh, uh, don't tell him I said that. Um, uh, hey, hey, man, you could walk by, and they smell like Fritos. I have never figured that out. But, but uh, there could be times that maybe Dad walked by his room, and he's like, man, what do you got Fritos in here? Oh, it's just your socks. You know, he started yelling, and I'd come out of my room like, if your dad's not yelling about my socks. Now, I was, came out of a pigsty. You know, he just didn't happen to see my stuff laying around all over the floor and all the pit that I had, had made. But I'm boasting because Larry got in trouble, and I, I did not. Paul's saying, uh, Christian, <laughs> Christian, where, where's the boasting? I mean, I mean, honestly, you don't get to stick your chest out and walk around people who have sinned as if you never have. As if you, you've been righteous your whole life. You don't get to do that. that. That's not part of the game. You don't get to look down on people who've made mistakes. You don't get to treat unbelievers as second-class citizens because you and I both know that you are no better than they are. You came out of a dirty room yourself. I mean, honestly, it's just as dirty and stinky as theirs. Jesus just happened to clean yours up. You didn't. What are you boasting about? 
Where is the boasting? I'm no better than the God-haters. I am no better than the sexually deviant. I am no better than the greedy, gossipy, corrupt people Paul has been writing about in chapters 1, 2, and the first part of chapter 3. We are no more deserving of heaven than anyone else on earth. We are right before God because of Jesus. He did everything. He did all of it. We did nothing in this transaction. So, so we, don't, we don't look down on those who are outside of God's grace. We don't hate them. We don't protest against them. We don't judge them. We don't talk down to them. We don't talk negatively about them. We pray for them. We pray for their souls. We beg and plead for them to come to their senses. And we do everything we can to invite them to Jesus. We bring them to church. We invite them to Bible studies. We pour our lives into them. We do whatever we can so that they will know what we know and experience the grace and mercy and forgiveness that we have experienced. And sometimes we just need to be reminded of our place in the world as Christians. And Paul does it right here. We are sinners saved by grace, inviting anyone and everyone to experience the love of God the way we have experienced him in a way that transforms their souls and gives them entrance in the kingdom of God. That's what this whole thing's about.